I did with just a starter strip of bare wax. I just made a sheet of wax and made a starter strip. I, I've quit doing that because it's too much work. It works all right, but it's just a lot of labor to make the sheets of wax and then wax them in. And then someday when the hive goes cleanless and the wax moths chew it all out, I have to do all that work again. But anyway, that's foundationless. Um, interestingly, that, that comb right in the center there is about 4.6 millimeters. And we'll talk a little bit about cell sizes as we go here. So why would you want to do foundationless? Um, all of you who've ever uh, bought all the equipment, uh, you know, a frame board and, and a, a spooler and a crimper and a bedder and have done, done the whole thing of, you know, putting wax foundation in and, and embedding the wires and all that, you know how much work that is. Um, so maybe, uh, of course, some of you love doing that, so maybe you should just keep doing it because you love doing it, I don't know. Uh, me, I find it extremely tedious. I think it's a lot less work to do foundationless, and if I do it with any kind of wood starter strip, we'll talk more about what starter strips are in a minute here, but if I do it with any kind of wood starter strip, it's pretty much permanent in the sense that all I really have to do is scrape off the old stuff and put it back in the hive, and I don't even have to haul it back to the house to do that. So it's a lot less work. Um, but. The other thing, the other two things I get is I get clean wax. Um, if you look at most of the chemicals being used for uh, uh, for Varroa a few years ago, they were all lipophilic insecticides, meaning they liked wax, and they were all insecticides before they relabeled them to kill Varroa. Um, they, and, and you're putting this in a hive, and it accumulates in the wax. Um, now when you buy foundation, it's already contaminated because everybody sells their wax back to the people who make the foundation. And it's all contaminated when they get it and then they make the foundation and sell it to you and it's all contaminated. Um, several people have done some studies on this. Jennifer Berry did one not too long ago and before that, uh, uh, Mary Ann Frazier in, in, from Pennsylvania uh, did, did a study on it. And the fact is, the foundations you buy are already contaminated. Um, part of this issue is of, of using natural comb is cell size. Um, if, you, if you look at the historic, well, I, I'll briefly touch on this. Uh, most of you probably, in, in my experience, going to all of these beekeeping meetings are obsessed with Varroa. I haven't had a Roa issue for more than a decade, so I frankly get tired of talking about Roa. And I get tired of people telling me that what I'm doing doesn't work, because um, obviously it does. But um, uh, but either it helps with Roa or it doesn't. But, I, but if it doesn't, I don't think it's going to hurt your Roa problems. And if it does, then you've solved your Roa problems. But the historical facts are this. A guy named Badeau, he wasn't really the first to notice that bigger bees came out of bigger cells, but he was one of the first ones to decide to try and exploit that. Uh, Huber was actually the first to notice that, that uh, you had bigger drones out of big drone cells and littler drones out of littler drone cells, and so he experimented with trying to get workers out of bigger cells, but he didn't have any foundation to work with, so all he really had was drone cells and worker cells, so he tried putting worker larvae in drone cells, but it never really worked because the bees always removed them, so it just never worked out. But Badeau had foundation to work with because it had been invented. And so he took foundation and heated it up and stretched it and increased the cell size, and he would get bigger bees. And what he was really trying to get was a bee with a tongue long enough to work red clover because there's tons of red clover and you know, millions of acres of it in Europe. And it makes a lot of nectar. And if the bees could just reach the nectar, then you could get a big honey crop off of that red clover. So that was really kind of his goal was getting a bee with a tongue long enough to do that. Um, but he kept upsizing the bees, and he kind of hit the limit of how much he could upsize them at about 5.6. And he sold the rest of the world on it, who increased bees. Natural, bees' natural cell size varies in size, but it probably averages out to about 4.9 to 5.0 millimeters in diameter. And he enlarged it all the way up to 5.6, and was raising bees in that and getting really big bees. Well, he, 
there was a lot of discussion on this. You can find all these old papers. They're all available on Google Books. You can find all these old e-magazines have been scanned in now. You can go look all this up for yourself if you want. A lot of them are posted on eSource, and I've got references to a lot of them on my website. But basically, during this period of time, some of the guys experimented with it too. Um, but Bedeau was the big, the guy who was really trying to sell it. And he managed to convince them all to increase the cell size to 5.4, from 4.9 to 5.4. That seems like a fairly small adjustment, but actually, when you increase the size of the, the, the diameter of the cell, you also, the bees build it deeper. So what you end up with is a bee that's half again as big. So you end up with a bee that's 150% of its original size when you get done. And that's what everybody in this country considers normal bees, because that's what you have. You have a large foundation, so you have large bees. Um, my bees are probably a lot smaller than yours if you have them on large cell foundation. Um, and large cell foundation is the standard foundation in this country, although there are some variations in foundation size. Um, the fact is they upsize them. So the question is, was that a good idea? If we'll look at some of the historic references, um, Mullen and Brown did this theirs fairly recently, and they referenced some of those, plus they measured the size of the bees on small cell and large cell to prove that actually bees on small cells are smaller, bees on large cells are bigger. Um, this, is, this is shown the volume at 5.555 millimeters. This, this is the Doe's work, and you can find that in, in the older bee cultures. This one happens to be from a 1945 edition I have, but it's in a lot of the older ones from about the 60s on back. I think you can usually find these charts of the Doe in ABC XYZ. But there's the volume of the cell compared to the diameter of the cell. And you'll notice he's got 4.7 down there as 192. So I guess the question is, can we assume that, that there is an appropriate size for them to build and the bees know what that is? Um, my theory is they do know what that is. There are some other issues and another discussion on the fact that a larger bee tends to build cells based on its own body size, so they don't tend to quite make it all the way back to natural size in one shot. But the fact is, if we stop artificially enlarging them, they don't get back to normal. Um, and I would assume that what they normally build is the right size. There are those who always think we can improve on nature. I don't tend to be one of those. I tend to think that it, it's already what it should be, and we, we are messing with it. Um, so what are the disadvantages to doing natural comb? Um, one of the disadvantages is just that uh, the more your habits are ingrained as a beekeeper, the harder it is to adjust to doing things differently, because things there are ramifications to anything that, that you're not used to, and then you have to adjust. One of those is that when you pick up a, a brand new soft white comb and you turn it flat ways like this, if it's not attached on the sides, it'll just break right out. Um, if I take an experienced old time beekeeper in my bee yard and I start showing them foundational frames, they'll break one of those off and they'll say some expletive. And, and I'll tell them you really want to try to avoid that, and five minutes later they'll do it again. Um, because they're in the habit of turning combs, they don't really think about it. If you do that to a newbie, they never break more than one. And they feel so horrible about it, they don't, you know, they never do it again because they think about it. But so it is hard to change your habits. You know, you have to change how you look at it. You pull a comb out of a Colony, you've got to look at that comb and think about it before you do something with it. You've got to think, is this brand new white wax? Is it heavy? Is it connected on the sides? What can I do? And after a while, you don't even have to think about those things because they become a habit eventually. But at first, you have to think about it because you, you, can't, just, you can't just treat it like it's uh, on, on a sheet of plastic like some of you were used to and flip it any which way you want. Um, so that makes an, that's an adjustment you have to make. It, it is more gradual at first. I've got a wonderful book up here, Huber's New Observations on Bees. Um, most of that, unfortunately, not the wax making part, but most of that's available for free on my website and an earlier translation on that one. But um, he goes into how they build wax. And when they first build wax, you, know, you, you think those flakes that they pull off of their abdomen are wax, but those are just what they make wax out of. They're pretty much wax. But then they mix it with some kind of thing in, from their saliva 
and they make it into this putty-like substance that they build comb out of. And it's soft. It's like putty. And then they use this and they build the comb. And then when they get done building the comb, they secrete another substance from their mouth, parts that they paint that with, that gives it that yellow tint that you're used to seeing. You, you think, you'll, you'll hear all kinds of people say that that wax is yellow because of pollen track, but it's not. It's because of the stuff they paint it with. And they, when they paint it with that, then it gets tough. Then it changes. So what we, what we start out with is this little hard flake. And then they turn it into, with their saliva into this soft, putty-like substance, and they build it. And then they come back and paint it with something that makes it get hard and tough. So if, they, if it's been painted with this stuff that makes it hard and tough, it's pretty, it's pretty strong. I, I can probably extract it. If it's still that white, soft, putty-like substance, then you really can't do much with it. It's too fragile to extract. Uh, you can make great comb honey out of it, but you can't extract it. And you have to be really gentle with it. So you have to learn to look at it and think about is this new white wax and do I have to be careful with it or is it tougher, older wax that I can, and it's attached all the way around and I can treat it a little, a little <coughs> more, uh, a little less care. Um, the other issue is leveling your hives. Some people don't level their hives ever and you, you can see them, you know, leaning way to one side. The problem with hives that lean, of course, is the more they lean, the more they lean. Because the more they lean, the more the weight's all to one side, and the more the weight's all to one side, the more that side sinks in, and it just keeps leaning more. Um, so it's good idea to have a level anyway, or they're going to fall over something. But if you don't level them with foundation, what's the problem is that, that these build comb perpendicular to the earth. They don't care how the frames go. So if you've got a bunch of frames in a box, and the box is leaning like this, they may start on the top bar of one frame and end up on the bottom bar of the next frame. So you want, to, you want to get the hive level this way and this way. It really doesn't matter, you know, it can tip toward the, if we're talking typical lengths for the hive, it can tip toward the front, which a lot of people do if they have a solid bottom board so the water will run off. That's fine, but it's the side to side that will get you off because then sometimes it'll start on one frame and end up on another frame if it ends too far. And even if it leans a little bit, it could end up kind of in the, in the frame a little, uh, a little angle, you know. Um, so those are probably the only big disadvantages from my point of view. Um, the advantages that, that you get that come along for the ride is it's less work, you get clean wax, you get healthier bees because of the smaller cell size. Um, and I think the clean wax should be a big issue because it's really the only way you're going to get clean wax in your hive is to let the things grow um, I suppose if you had unwaxed plastic and you put it in there, then in theory you didn't introduce a bunch of insecticides into your hive, but the bees don't like that much unless you put some beeswax on it, so um, I, I don't really consider that a real viable solution to the problem. You, you, you could accomplish this by making your own foundation. That's what E. Lusby does, that's what Kirk Webster does, he makes his own foundation. But um, I think that's an extremely tedious, time-consuming process, and since the bees are perfectly willing to make comb themselves, since I really don't want to coerce them into building a different size than what they normally would, I just send a lot of good foundations. Now, what, what's, the, what's the result of having contaminated wax? Well, there's plenty of studies out there that will show you that, that amitraz and, and cumofos and flavalamate in the wax causes infertile queens, causes infertile drones, and the problem with infertile greens, infertile queens and infertile drones is not just that they don't do well and that they don't lay well, but they get superseded all the time. And if the next queen is exposed to the same chemicals, she's probably not going to be very good either, and she's going to get superseded. And then you, uh, you see a lot of supersedures these days. You didn't used to. You'll see a lot of people buy a package and the queens get superseded three or four times in a year. Um, that's, that didn't used to be true. Uh, Nancy Ostagai, 10 years ago at a Kansas Honey Producers Association meeting, said that she thought the average queen got superseded three times a year now. <coughs> um, I don't, that's not true in my eyes. I don't, I don't have anything to base that on. I'm just, uh, she's basing that on her experience of talking to beekeepers and, and, and people who actually keep the mark and figuring out whether or not they got superseded. But um, it causes frequent supersedures to have contaminated wax in your hive. And, and it weakens your bees. Um, if you think about this, I, 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 think about the life cycle of a bee, of a worker bee. 
Um, and, and you think of it in economic terms, because really a bee, a bee colony is, is an economy. If you think about it in economic terms, there's really no profit, there's no surplus, there's no none of that honey that you want to take that's going to be your profit on this bee colony until the last few days of the life of this bee. Because the first, the first few days it's actually busy in the hive taking care of young and then doing house cleaning and then guarding the entrance and, and making wax and so on. It's not until it's halfway through its life that it ever start, goes out and starts to forage. And then the first couple of weeks of it foraging is just covering the overhead of raising all of that brood and maintaining the colony and, and bringing in the, the nectar they need to build wax and bringing in all, all the pollen they need to feed the young and the water to keep the hive cool. So this is all just overhead. And you don't really get the profit until the last couple of days of their life. That's where the profit is. And they finally actually have broken even, gotten a little bit ahead, and are making a profit. Now, if you shorten their life by even a day or two, you've taken a big chunk right off the top of the profit, <laughs> right off of your honey crop, uh, right off of their honey crop that they wanted to get through the winter on. So if you shorten the day, their lives even by a couple of days, you had a, a, a big impact on the hive. You think you have it, but I'm not talking about one bee. I'm talking about you shorten the lives of all of them by a couple of days. You've, you've really cut into their profit. I don't know how much those are affecting the workers. Nobody's really looking at that because that's a very difficult thing to measure. Because workers have such a short life to start with, and then uh, you know they they get to the end of their life. There's so many things that can go wrong. It's really hard to say if we're shortening the life of a worker bee or not. But if we're if we're impacting the health of the queen, which she lives long enough that we can measure, and impacting the fertility of the drones, which we can measure by just doing counts, um, then it, it's probably affecting the health of the workers. So how do you get natural pollen? That's that's the question we want to address right now. Um, if you're like me, I've got a lot of equipment sitting around, so I, what I do depends on what I've got laying around. If I was starting from scratch and I just want to do foundationless, Walter T. Kelly sells foundationless frames. You just buy them, put them together, and use them. Piece of cake, if that's what you want to do. Um, if you've already got a supplier you really like and you want to buy standard frames and turn them into foundationless, you've got your choice of any of these things. If you've already got equipment, I would use what you've got. I'm, I'm, Maybe I should write a book called The Frugal Beekeeper. I've been thinking about writing one called The Negligent Beekeeper because I've been so busy running around speaking, I don't, I'm not paying much attention to my bees anymore between working and speaking. But, um, but I, I tend to be a frugal beekeeper. I don't see much point buying anything if you've already got it. You, you should use it. So, depending on what you've got, if you've got a standard wedge frame, if you, take, if you break the wedge out and turn it, rotate it 90 degrees like this, here's, here's the wedge, and you rotate it this way, then it sticks down. That makes an edge. Now, it is a little bit of a lopsided edge in the sense that it's it's closer to the top bar on this side than this on this side by about a quarter of an inch. Um, but there's still that edge right down the middle. You would think it wouldn't be right down the middle, but oddly enough, it is. I I first heard of people doing this. I, I didn't think it would end up in the middle until I tried it, and I broke it off and put it in there. Sure enough, it's right down the middle. That that groove in the middle is wide enough, but it ends up pretty much, uh, it's not off by much if it's, if it's off at all. Um, but it makes an edge. The bees need an edge to follow or they're not going to they're not going to build the call in the frame. It, they need something to guide them to get them to build the frame. So to make a comb guide on a wedge top bar, the easiest thing to do is break out the wedge and turn it sideways. Does that make sense? The next one I've got here is groove top bars. Um, if you've got a groove top bar, you need to put something in there for an edge. Some people will put a little strip of foundation, and that works. It's, a, it's just more work, and I have to redo it. If, if this hive ever goes queenless and the wax moths take over, then I have to scrape all that out, take it back home, and then wax another piece of, of, of another strip of foundation in there. And that'll work, but I'm too lazy to do all that work. Um, if you put a wooden strip in there, on the other hand, it works just as well as far as guiding them, and it's fairly permanent. Wax moss, chew it up. I can just kind of scrape the wax off, and it's still got that edge there, that wooden edge. Um, that wood that you put in there can be what they call jumbo craft sticks if you go buy them at the craft store. And I call it a tongue depressor, having um, grown up when doctors were always sticking those in my mouth, and the wood about that wide. Um, you can get paint sticks at the 
paint stir sticks at the hardware store, they work pretty well. And if you're really handy and you already have a table saw, you can just rip little thin strips of wood off of a one by, off the edge of a one by and use them. If you're not handy with a table saw, I wouldn't go buy one just to do this. First of all, ripping little thin pieces of wood is a tricky proposition, and it's not worth losing a finger over it. But if you're already handy with that, and you're already, you already have one, then it's probably worth considering. Um, with, with you, if you already got a drawn comb here and you just want natural comb instead, if you cut it out and leave the row of cells all the way around and cut the middle out, they'll follow all those cells that are there. Now I say that, that sounds simple, but there's so many different situations you can find yourself in because it could be vertically wired already, it could be horizontally wired already, it could be uh, plastic, it could be, and none of those are going to work out as well. I don't know why this is uh, making the weird noises, but. Um, I think I'm welcome to my shirt. I don't think so. Put it in your pocket. What's that? Put it in your pocket. I'll put it in my pocket. I don't know if that would help. I'll leave the old chance. So, assuming you just had wax, you could just cut it out and leave the raw cells around there. If you've got wires, the wires complicate things, and I can't say how it will turn out depending on whether they're vertical or horizontal wires and a bunch of other issues and how, how they're attached and so on. Um, but, uh, another way is just take any old empty frame and put it between two drawn brood combs in the brood nest and they'll draw a beautiful, perfect comb on there almost every time. Uh, in fact, that's the best way to get really good straight combs, to put it between two really good straight combs in the brood nest. Um, I've seen people with two plastic frames, one piece frames, and cut the middle out. I think it's too much work, in my opinion, but uh, if you're going to do it, probably the way to do it is drill a hole in it to get something started. That, like a half inch hole and then take a saber saw and cut it out. But, uh, me, I find somebody who wants the plastic and give it to them. Um, you can buy some stuff called uh, uh, chamfer molding. Um, it's basically just a little triangular shaped piece of wood. Um, but it seems like it's difficult to find. If you go to all these pseudo lumber yards that exist now, like you know, Home Depot or or Lowe's or I don't know what you around here. They have different things in different parts of the country, but um, they usually don't know what you're talking about and they're extremely unhelpful. Um, if you go to a real lumber yard, like some small town that actually has a lumber yard, they not only know what it is, they'll order it for you if they don't have it in stock, and they'll probably have it in stock. Um, but um, it's, it's a chamfer molding. But if, if you've got a table saw again and you're handy, you can run a, three, run a one by through there with a saw at 45 degrees and make yourself all the chamfer molding you want. Um, anyway, you can nail that to the bottom of, a, of the frame and it makes a nice comb guide. You can also, just if they're not assembled yet, you can cut a 45 on the, on the top bar, just on the bottom of the top bar, cut a 45 degree angle on both sides so it comes to a point. Um, Here's a foundation's frame. I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at the back wall, you can see that angle. Sorry, I can't turn my, got to keep my back turned to the speaker. You can see the angle at the very back there. On the left side, you can see the angle. On the right side, it's a shadow, so you can't see it very well. And the rest of it's all two-dimensional, so you really can't tell very well, but that's, a, that's got a, a point. That's a V-shaped top bar, so there's a point on it. And basically, I bought these from Walter T. Kelly with no bruise in the bottom bar because I don't want to place them all small eye needles in the wax model larva to hide, and no bruise in the top bar. And then I just cut, I cut the metal. Um, and they sell no bruise bottom bars standard at Walter T. Kelly. That's always been in their catalog for as long as I've been keeping these, which is 40 years, and probably had them for 40 years before that. I don't know. Um, the no groove top bar had a custom order, but they just said next time they were making a run of top bars, they'd just not put the groove in it for me, and I bought a thousand of them, that probably helped. But, but uh, they, they sold them to me, and I kept the bevel on these. This is that same bevel top bar with, with uh, foundationless foam in it. And you, this is probably a typical foundationless frame, because you can see 
on the bottom, they, they hesitated until last to connect it, so it doesn't look quite the same, that last little quarter inch of the bottom, and the sides are kind of the same way. They kind of waited till the end and then finally attached it. And then, uh, but, but you can see it has a little bit of a yellow cast to it. This is, this is easily uh, extracted. It's, it's, it's mature comb because it's got that yellow cast to it, and it's attached at least a little bit on all sides. And I extracted it right after I took this picture. So, the typical questions I get about foundationless. Um, can I wire them? Um, you can. I don't because the wires always seem to be in my way. But I run all mediums and that probably helps because they're only six and a quarter inches deep instead of nine and a quarter inches deep. So I don't have as much cone to support before it hits the bottom line. But I know people who are doing deeps and doing foundationless and not wiring, so I can't say it can't be done, but since I haven't done it, I can't speak from personal experience how well that works out. But I don't wire them because it seems like the wire always seems to be right where I want to cut out a queen cell if I'm doing that, or if, I'm, if it's in the supers, it's right on a nice white piece of wax I want to do cut comb on. Um, it's hard to get nice white wax for cut comb. I don't know if you guys have realized that, but most of those big old beekeeping books were all about raising comb honey, and raising comb honey is a tricky proposition to try and get that nice soft white wax. So when I'm extracting and I find a frame that's all nice soft white wax that I know I can't extract, that's a bonus because I get nice good cut comb out of it. It's comb honey. So um, I don't wire them because then I go to cut it for cut comb and it's got wires running through it. I don't really want wires in it. But you can wire them if you want and it will support them uh, they'll just build right through the wires. It doesn't really slow them down much. Um, can you extract them? I extract them all the time. I don't. Uh, everybody says, well, you know, is there any trick to that? Well, it's the same trick there is to extracting anyway, in my opinion. Any time, if I've got wax foundation and it's new, white, soft wax, I can blow it out easy as pie. I, don't, I just put it in there and crank it up. And it does have foundation. Even if it's got wires in it, it'll blow out if it's nice, smooth, soft wax and I crank it up too fast. So you gotta be gentle. Uh, if you're buying an extractor, keep in mind, I think, I don't see much point of an extractor that isn't uh, variable speed. You need to be able to start slow and work your way up. If, you, if all you can do is turn it on or off, uh, I don't think that's a very good design for an extractor, but that's my opinion. But apparently those exist. I've never owned one that wasn't variable speed. But, um, I have people tell me that's what theirs is, it's just an on-off switch. Uh, I wouldn't buy one of those if it was me, but uh, e either that or uh, uh, if you're handy with electric, ele electrical stuff and you already have one, you can re redo it. Uh, I'll warn you, motors in this day and age are, are a strange and complex thing. There are different kinds of motors and some of them you can do variable speed on and some of them there is no changing it because they're using the phase of the electricity in order to control how the motor works, and, and that controls the speed of the motor, and the reason you can't change the speed is because it's tied to the phase of the electricity. So um, it depends on the kind of motor you've got, whether it's even possible to, to convert it to that. But um, anyway, enough said about extractors. Um, one of the arguments everybody says is they'll always build drones. Uh, I'll probably touch on this subject off and on all day today, but um, I, I let them build all their own comb and they let, I let them build as much drone as they want. The fact is the bees have two thresholds as far as drones are concerned. They have a threshold of how much drone comb they really want, and then they have a threshold of how many drones they want right now, depending on the time of year, the, the flow, the pollen, the, the whatever. That drives how many drones they want. Um, and that varies throughout the year. The amount of drone comb they want, uh, their drive to have it varies depending on the needs of the colony. If the colony needs a lot of workers, they're not going to build any drone comb. When you first put a package in, they usually don't build any drone comb because they're trying, to, they're trying to raise a bunch of workers. But once they have enough workers, they'll start to build some drone comb even if they don't want to raise any drones, just, and they'll put honey in it. And then uh, and they'll try and get up to about 20% drone comb, maybe 25. Some people will quote 15, but uh, I, I think 20 to 25 is a more accurate number in my, in my observation. Um, typically, I've got an eight frame box, and I've got nine frames in it, and two of those are usually drone comb, and I usually have them on the outside. So I've got uh, seven frames of, of 
Worker column to two frames of drone column who have been on Worker Foundation and you've limited the amount of drone column they have by using Worker Foundation and especially if you've been culling the drone column, then they basically don't have any drone column and they still have this threshold they don't need. So if you give them the opportunity, this wide open space to build a column, they're going to build a solid drone almost every time because they, they, they've been itching to do this for a long time and you finally gave them the opportunity. So they'll build this whole frame of drone, and so the newbie in this field will, of course, pull that out because they've been told the drone is bad, so they put another one in, take that one out of the colony altogether, and of course they draw out the drone comb for the same reason they drew the first one, because they still haven't met their threshold yet. Um, and you pull that one out and put another one in, of course they'll draw out all the drone comb because they still haven't met their threshold yet. So you can easily conclude that all they'll build is drone comb, but if you left that first one in, they probably would have drawn another one that was all drone comb, and if you left that one in, they probably start losing that itch. They, they might build some more depending on how much drone comb there is in the rest of the colony, but odds are they'll probably have met their, their quota for the moment and, and they'll start building some worker cells. So they won't just build drone comb. I, I, I run into this all the time. Some old timer will tell some new, key, new beekeeper who wants to try this that, that they will build nothing but drones. And then of course they do build nothing but drones and then they freak out. But, um, but obviously, wild bees don't build nothing but drones, or we wouldn't have any bees. Um, so that's just not true. Um, will they mess it up? Well, they mess up everything from time to time. They mess up plastic a lot. <coughs> I have a foundation. I get pins off of it. I get these little parallel combs that come out and go next to it. I get I get all kinds of messed up comb using plastic. I'd say all in all, I get a lot more messed up comb using plastic than I do using foundationals. But if I was averaging it all out, I'd say I get about the same amount of messed up home no matter what I do. Um, the, the thing you got to keep in mind though, and the thing that's important to understand in foundationalists, which you really ought to understand anyway because it's basic bee biology, is that bees build parallel combs. Everybody got that? Bees build parallel combs. So if they build some wild corner to corner comb in this super of foundationless frames, where's the next comb going to go? Right next to it. Parallel to that one, we're running an angle across the column. I, I see a lot of people nowadays getting into a top bar hive and they dump a package into a top bar hive and, and usually they build them fine, but once in a while somebody's will go wild and build some angled thing in there. And so then they decide, well, I'm just gonna let them I'm gonna let the bees sort it out. They'll they'll figure it out eventually. No, they won't figure it out. They've already figured it out. <laughs> they build parallel combs. That's what they figured out. And they already built one comb that's not where you want it, that means all the rest of them are going to be not where you want them. <laughs> so you need to get one where you want it so that they'll build the rest of them parallel to that one. So if, if you, when you first put a colony on a whole bunch of foundational frames and there's no drawn comb in there, you better make sure that first comb is straight because if it's not, none of them are going to be. Um, and that's the downside to foundationalists if, there, if there's a downside here and that's the with foundation, at least they get a clean slate every time. They have to decide to mess the next one up because there's another wall of foundation here. They have to decide that they're going to mess it up. It's not, it kind of sets them back on the right track. Um, where with foundation, they're going to build parallel combs because that's what they do. Um, so, do they mess it up more often? Well, if you keep an eye on it, I think you break about even. If you don't keep an eye on it, you'll end up, if, if one comb is totally messed up, the whole box will be messed up if you don't intervene. Now, if I get a box that's totally messed up because, I, I, because I've been a negligent beekeeper lately because I haven't had time to get out to my eyes, usually it's in a super anyway and I just harvest it at the end of the year. Um, I wait till it's cold enough, there's no bees in it, and I don't even have to worry about running the bees out, and I just steal the box. Um, and then cut it all out, clean it all up, and give it back to them next year. And, and then every once in a while I hit somebody who says that, that they can't draw a comb without foundation. I don't, I don't even know how to address that. Um, if you want to go to foundationalist because you want to get all these chemicals out of your hive and you want natural sized cells and you want to accomplish all of this, how, how fast you have to do this. You can do it any speed you want. Personally, I, I like to go with the flow. Um, I, I guess I find myself more and more... Uh, uh, when I, when I was young, I always seemed to be swimming upstream, you know? I was always fighting everything. And I, I finally one day figured out, you know, everything has a flow to it. If you can figure out what the flow is and kind of work with it, instead of against it, things just go much better. Um, and that's true converting over as 
so foundationalists or whatever. You can go in and shake all the bees off the wall of their comb and take it all away from them and make them start all over again. But I don't recommend it. Um, there's a flow to the, to the colony if you kind of work with that. There's a cycle through the year. If you kind of work with that, you can replace all your combs in, in a couple of years without stressing the bees out. First of all, in the spring, there's usually a lot of empty comb. Early in the spring, before they blow really start, you can pull all that empty comb out and you don't really set them back much at all. Um, now you can keep moving whatever the, the combs are that not, are not the size you want towards the outside and feeding the empty ones in the middle and they'll draw them nice and straight because you've got good straight combs there. They'll draw those nice and straight and they get a bunch of nice straight combs. And as you get to the edge of the wall, they usually tend to fill those with honey instead of brood, especially if you've got a 10 frame Langstroth instead of an 8 frame, they tend to fill those with honey instead of brood <coughs> if they're already drawn. And you can pull the frames of honey out, once there's a good flow going, you can pull frames of honey out and they've got more coming in. You know, it's not, not a big loss. So you can start pulling those out. So over the course of the year, you could probably pull out half of the cones that are on the colony in the course of the year and not really have stressed them out that much. Um, and you can repeat it again next year, you pretty much got all of them out. So how fast you want to do it kind of depends on, on how determined you are. I don't know how many of you have ever met Dee Leslie, but she's the kind of person when she makes up her mind to do something, she's going to do it. And she's going to do it now. And, and so she just shook all her bees off of the large cell home and threw it all away and put and put small and put them on. Actually, she did this in two steps. She was going for 5-0 at first, and she put them all on 5-0, and then she decided that she wanted to go to 4-9, so she did it all over again. Shook them all off, took all the combs away, put them on. And she stressed out her bees a lot, she lost a lot of bees in the process, but she got them regressed, and she was the only person who I could find who was keeping bees alive without treating them when the, the Varroa was, was here. And, and uh, I couldn't find anybody else who thought it was possible. She was the only person I could find who actually said it was possible, and, and, uh, and it was all about cell size. But, so what do you do with all this foundation? Well, I have to say it, I just threw a whole bunch of it away. I'm moving and I just didn't want to move it again. I kept, I kept meaning to give it to somebody who I couldn't convince to use natural cell or small cell, um, but I finally just gave up and threw it away. Um, I probably should have found somebody who could use it just because they're still making large cell plastic and I just filled the landfill with some large cell plastic. I feel kind of bad, but, um, but I had to get ruthless. I'm going to move. I'm going to have a pack rat, so. Um, but there's a good chance whatever equipment you've got that you don't really want anymore because you decided to change your direction of beekeeping, and if there's somebody out there who's buying that right now, and you could, if you're feeling generous, you can give it to them, or if you're not, you can sell it to them for a reasonable discount, and uh, probably uh, I'm not, not too bad on it. So, assuming that cell size really doesn't matter, doesn't have anything to do with Roa, doesn't really make your hive any healthier, um, you're, it's not going to hurt to have natural sized cells, and you're going to get clean wax. Um, the, the typical uh, recommendation right now for rotating your combs out is that you rotate one fifth of your combs out every year, so in five years you rotate all your combs out. And they're recommending that mostly because of the chemicals that people are putting in the colonies that are building up in the wax. But, uh, and I actually don't do that. But if you were going to follow the standard recommendations out there, in five years you could replace all your combs just by replacing one out of five every year. But if you're using any kind of chemicals, you should rotate your combs out. And if you're going to rotate your combs out anyway in five years, you can have all natural cells. Um, here's a big one for me. It's a lot less work. I think that's, I, I think that's always important. Um, your natural comb is going to be uh, not contaminated. And in, in, in the process of rotating them through, you'll get all those contaminated comes out of your colony. And, and we already know that the contamination causes short-lived and infertile queens and drones. Best case scenario is, assuming cell size does matter as far as the health of the bees and as far as the rural mites, um, and you, get, you not only get the clean wax, but you also get no rural problems and healthier bees, and you still get the less work. Um, I, I, I will say this about scientific studies. Do you, I, I like you all, you guys all understand how a scientific study is done. This, and the, it's not, not just picking on the beekeeping people, because this is pretty much how all of them get done, but 
uh, well, some of them are just <coughs> financed by somebody who wants to prove something for their industry, you know, like Bayer or Monsanto or something. But, but, but the typical stuff that comes out of the universities usually goes something like this. Uh, somebody's working on their master's degree or their doctorate in, we'll say, entomology, since we're talking about bees. They go to their professor um, with a proposed study trying to prove something that supposedly either we don't really know or it really hasn't been explored quite as far as they'd like, or they'd like to go. And it's usually the year's at least half over, assuming they're really planning ahead doing well. Probably the year's mostly over because most college students aren't that focused. Um, and they go to the professor with this plan and they say, well, this is what I want to do. And he says, well, I got four hives I can spare for that. And you've got two weeks to get it done because I still got to grade it. And we still got to have a whole bunch of other people review it. And we're already close to the end of the year. So you got four hives in two weeks and, and, and I need you to get this done. So they go out and they do this thing and they use four hives in two weeks. They come back with the results. The professor puts his name on the study as if he did it, which he didn't. And then the, the student gets their name under that, and then this thing gets published in some journal somewhere, and all of a sudden we have some new beekeeping fact. This is now a fact. Two hives, two weeks, you know, maybe four hives, two weeks. So a big study might be 20 hives in six months, but that's pretty much it. Um, I have 200 hives, and, and, and as far as small cell, I've been doing this for 14 years. I really have more faith in my results than I do in their results. But, um, but, but let's talk about just, the, just the, the concept of what you prove in the lab compared to what happens in real life. Let's say this is pretty much real life here. You take 10 prairie dogs and you put them in a cage over here, and you take 10 prairie dogs and you put them in a cage over here. And you poison these 10 prairie dogs and they all die. Now what is my scientific conclusion here? If I poison prairie dogs, I end up with less prairie dogs. Is that a valid conclusion? It is in the lab. But in real life, they tried this in Nebraska, where I used to live in western Nebraska. They tried to poison all the prairie dogs. They killed all the black-footed ferrets off. They killed off a lot of the burrowing owls that eventually bounced back. They killed off a lot of rattlesnakes and hawks and eagles and coyotes and foxes. And, and they even killed off a lot of prairie dogs. But prairie dogs reproduced so fast that it was pretty irrelevant. Because what was relevant was that they killed off all the predators. Because when they bounced back, they had 10 times as many prairie dogs as before they poisoned them. So my point is that often the results we get are the opposite of what we think we're going to get. We, we think it's intuitively obvious if I kill prairie dogs, I'll end up with less prairie dogs, but that's not true. Um, if you want, to, you want to maximize the mosquito population, go out and spray for mosquitoes. You'll kill off all the dragonflies, you'll kill off all the little mosquito eaters, you know, that look like giant mosquitoes. You'll kill off all these insects that eat mosquitoes. You'll kill them all out, and it's irrelevant because there's so many mosquito larvae in that water that they're all going to hatch couple of days here and there'll be nothing to eat them. And you'll end up with 10 times as many mosquitoes. And nobody ever wants to take that into account. They just want to think in terms of the first degree of order here. They think, I want to get rid of mosquitoes, so I'll kill mosquitoes. And they don't take into account that they're also killing off their predators. Um, I, I think you've got to look at scientific research for what it is. It's something that worked in a lab. It's not necessarily something that's going to work in real life. Anyway, that's, that's, that's my thing on the small cell there. But, um, you can look up more stuff about this. I've got a whole page on just natural cell size and, and varroa, and uh, that's that page. The next one down is the presentation. It's just a PowerPoint presentation on that same page. And then the next one down is the, the page that's pretty much the information I did in this presentation presented web page rather than this. Um, this is just for fun. Here's, here's my health certificates for the last uh, few years. This is 2004. The inspector comes out, inspects my hives in my own yard where I raise my queens and inspects how many he wants. Some years it's more, some years it's less. He inspects for, for Falbum, which he never does in any of these. He inspects for uh, Varroa and other things. Once in a while, they find some chalk root and whatever. But anyway, I'll flip through these real quick. You'll notice uh, he's got Varroa. He examined 12 colonies and he found no Varroa. And this year, he examined 12 colonies and he found no Varroa. And this year, he inspected 15 colonies and he found no Varroa. 
and this year he inspected 26 colonies and he found no varroa. And this year he inspected 20 colonies and he found no varroa. And this year he inspected 33 colonies and he found no varroa. And this year he inspected 14, 16 colonies and 10 of those colonies had some varroa. It was also a little later in the year, but um, this year he inspected eight colonies and he found one colony that had varroa in it. But that doesn't mean there wasn't varroa in it, it just means that he didn't. His sampling method didn't come up with a varroa. I'm pretty sure they all have varroa. Uh, this is 23, no varroa, and that's the end of those. So just so you know, I'm not, I'm not just hallucinating that I, that I don't have a varroa issue. Uh, anyway, this is my email address. If you'd like to email me, I encode it because it's out there on the web, and the spam bots always seem to find my email address, and then I get all sorts of advertisements for things I have no interest in buying. Uh, and that's my website. And that's the name of my book. Thanks.